wonderful to be stood up here to honour the Lord. But first of all, let's get the good news out of the way. I'm not a preacher. Amen. I'm not one of those who stands in front of your church and says, you can't do this, you can't do that, and you can't do the other. And sometimes laugh, and we're doing exactly the same as what we are. I'm here to give you a choice. The same choice that I was given 28 years ago. Not only Warringtoners and Wiganers have the same expressions, but my mum had a wonderful expression made me laugh. If I did anything wrong, my mum would say, listen, you're going to get a slap, but it'll hurt me more than what it'll hurt you. <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> Hands up, how many times said that to the kids? <sighs> it hurt me more than my mum, I'll tell you. And then she'd love me after me. She'd, she'd sit me on my knee and tell me why she'd give me a good slap. But I was brought up, uh, I went to a junior school when I was five and I went there until I was 11 and then I moved on to secondary modern school. I think they're all academies now, high schools. It was at the age of 11 that I got involved in sport. I had a bad childhood till 11 years old. I used to go to my dad's at weekend. And at first it was okay. But then from the age of six, five, six, I started to get sexually abused by my father. And it went on for a number of years. I was begging inside for it to be stopped. And I think when I was 10 years old, he came to my house and I wouldn't get undressed and he gave me a good slapping. And my sister jumped up and gave him a good slap. And she said, don't ever come for our bill again. And I thank God that in my time of life, I didn't know God, I was a kid, everything stopped. But I was an angry person from then. I grew up angry. I got involved in sport when I was 11. And for a lot of years, sport became my God. Rugby league, football, cricket, tennis, anything you can mention, it was sport. And when I was on that rugby field, I took a lot of my anger out on the opposition because I, I could never, I had no way of forgiving what had happened to me. And I was an angry young man. And that's how I grew up, an angry young man going through school. But at the age of 15, I left school on the Friday night. And I had a job waiting on the Sunday, on the Monday, sorry. And we played a final in Wigan. And we played your arch enemy witness, schoolboys. And during that game, some big boy landed on my knee and completely snapped my knee. And I went into the hospital that night at five foot ten. And I came out of the hospital 18 weeks later, six foot two. And my mum went, went mad because she had to buy me new pants and everything. She went berserk my mum. But at the age of 15, when I left school, we did then, I mean, we got into drinking. We got into young girls. I don't mean literally meeting young girls and, and living that life of a 15-year-old that he would do. And at the age of 15, I met, well, I met my missus, my lovely missus. Who, uh, she sends her apologies tonight. She's got a bit of a dick of a tummy. That's why she's not here. And uh, I used to go to a, a nightclub in Hindley called Monaco Ballroom. Remember, have you been in Monaco? But well, do you remember when you walk in, you go to, right to the bar, there was iron railings and then there was a downstairs part. But I was boozing at the top with my mates. I'd just turned 16. And this beautiful young lady walked in. And I, it was love at first sight, I fancied her straight away. But she went and sat at the bottom of the iron railings and I was at the top, so I thought, I've got to go and earwig. So I go down and I'm wigging Sheila and She's with a friend who I knew later to be Marjorie. And the police walked in. I remember Sheila saying to Marjorie, hey, I'm only 17, what well, if I get, catch me, mum will kill me. So I just thought, go on, Bill, that's the door open for you. So I walked in, stood outside of Sheila, and I knew the bobbies would walk past, and as they started walking past, I could see her shaking. I said, what's the matter? She said, I'm only 17. I said, look. I said, if you give me a kiss, they'll walk straight past you. And that was my opening line. I met Sheila with a kiss. And we've been married, what, just done 50 years? Kath, this is my lovely daughter, Kathleen, one of our children. 
We did eventually have seven children of our own. We've now got, I think, 29 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. So as you can see, when the Lord said to us, go forth, we should have gone first. We wouldn't have had all them kids. But praise God, we've been blessed. We have a wonderful family. It's been hard work, mainly, as you'll hear, for Sheila, because I was into a world of rugby. I was into a world of sport. Well, at the age of 18, I was playing amateur rugby league. And we played a team from a place called Adlington near Wigan. And we just barely won the game, 134 nil. And uh, there was a scout from Wigan. And he approached me after the game and he said, Bill, we want you to come and play for Wigan. I'll have trials at Wigan. Well, he could have asked anybody. But he asked me. So I decided, spoke to my coach then, he had no dad. I didn't want a dad, obviously, you know what had happened. And uh, he said, uh, we want you to come for three trials. So I went for these trials and I played one at Liverpool, one at, second one was against Workington at Wigan, middle of winter, played winter rugby league, snow, sludge, everything. And after the game, they didn't let me come into the dressing room. They took me straight into the boardroom and said, we want you to become a professional rugby player with Wigan. Well, I knew, as I told you, 18, I got married when I was 17. I should have played professional football when I was 17. Blackburn Rovers asked me to sign forms at Blackburn Rovers. But when I came home with the news that I could be a professional football player, I was met with the news off Sheila's dad. His exact words is in a wig into anger, he said, I've some news, lad. I said, what is it? He said, that's getting her Sheila pregnant. Well, I was first thing I thought was my mum will kill me. <laughs> so I said, who's good to tell me, mum? I'm not. He said, I'll tell her. So we went round my mum's and I hid behind him and he said, uh, Mrs. Ash, just your, uh, your bill's got her, Sheila pregnant. Well, my mum, she picked poker up and she chased me with poker, my mum. She said, I'll kill her. But anyway, obviously we, we got married 2nd of December, 1966. I always said the best thing ever happened in 1966. England won the World Cup. I've got a wonderful missus, as I said, I've got a wonderful family. But I signed for Wigan, they, asked me, they offered me this money. They said, well, if you sign for Wigan, we'll give you a thousand pound. I'm 18, married, with, we had two kids then, I think we had two kids, Kath then, uh, Graham and our girl. And uh, I said, well, I'll sign if I get money. He said, we'll give you a thousand pound. I went, flipping heck, my eyes must have gone tic-tac-toe, a thousand pound, I'll sign. He said, but hang on, he said, I'm... We won't give it you all, all at once. I said, what will he give me then? He said, we'll give you 100 quid tonight. He said, if you can get so many games in the first team, we'll give you 400 quid. And if you become good enough to play for Lancashire, you'll get 250. And if you can play for Great Britain, you'll get another 250. Well, I said, look, give me 100 pound, one pound notes now and I'll sign. They must have had it ready. Within two minutes, I had under quid on the table. I signed, became a professional rugby league player, went down for a shower. All the lads that took all the hot water, there's no hot water. I'm up to neck in mud. I threw my clothes on, I lived three miles away from the ground. I ran it home. I ran into the house, I said, Sheila, great news, I've just become a professional rugby player at Wigan. And I threw the under quid in the air, I said, look at that. I'll have a guess how I celebrated my signing becoming a professional rugby league player. I got my tin bath off wall and I had a tin bath in front of fire. And up who's got it, who used to have a tin bath, some of them. It's not the same now, is it? Front of fire, wife put it hot water in and a cup of coffee in a butty having a ball. What a, couldn't beat them tin baths. You've never lived your young ones, Kathleen. I keep telling you that, don't I? And I celebrated and I got in the world of rugby league. And I was already in the world of the devil because I didn't know God. I had my three kids. And I remember getting drunk time and time again. I got paid for playing rugby league. Sheila brought up my three kids. She was bringing them up. I was working and playing rugby league, drinking, gambling, working and playing rugby league, drinking, gambling, women. And I'd never been to church. I didn't know what a prayer was. 
I remember one, my eldest son, I call at that time, he was about three and a half, and he had very little pneumonia, measles, and something else. And I remember going home drunk and the ambulance is outside the house. And I remember pushing Sheila out of the way. And I remember getting in the ambulance. I'll go with him, big man. And I remember staggering in the ambulance. I remember sitting there and I remember praying. God make him better. I'll not have another cig. God make him better. I'll not have another pint. I'll not have another drink. I'll not look at another woman. The Lord made him better. What does it mean what I'd said? Absolutely nothing. Sobered up and completely forgotten him. That's the way I live my life. And Sheila brought the kids up. We finished up. Uh, Kath was born a little bit later. And I was playing for Wigan Rugby League. And it was a tough game. As I've told you, I was brought up an angry young man. And on the rugby field, I was an angry young man. Whatever it took to be the best, that's how I played my game. If I used my feet, if I used my head, or if I used my hands and my elbows, that's how I live. I wanted to be the best at whatever it took. And whatever, if I had to abuse the opposition, whether it be racist remarks, whether it be fighting, whether it be football, I wanted to be the best. And that's, in my mind, what it took. And I lived that life on the field. But the most good thing about living a life on the field is, whatever happened onto the pitch, you never took it off. You never held grudges off it, but you did when you went back on it. I mean, I got sent off 17 times in my career. I always said there was about 14 mistaken identities and uh, I think one dog left his white sticker with his white sticker and his dog, one referee in the rest of the room, I think. It wasn't all guilt. I remember playing one game and I've hit one lad and the referee said, I'm sending you off. He said, what for? He said, a bad tattle. He said, I said, what do you mean a bad tattle? He said, well, it was a late tattle. I said, but sir, I said, I got there as quick as I could. But he still sent me off, you know what I mean? They had no sense of humor, them referees. Well, there come a time when I broke my elbow, my right elbow. Have you played my game? You carried the ball in your left, or you, put your, you, you always guarded yourself with your elbow, because somebody would do you otherwise. That's the evil game it was. I mean, people said to me, what injuries have you had, Bill? And I start off from my feet, 14 operations on my knees, I've done my ribs, I've got a plastic cheekbone, I've got a plastic kneecap. I can take all my false teeth out or whatever I'm not doing. And I never had ball. Ball was 40 yards away. I never got up when I had ball. It was absolutely evil game. And we were top drinkers. And we were top drinkers. And, you know, the women, well, it was easy. But it got easier, as you'll hear later on, when I went to Australia. But there came a time when I broke my elbow at Wigan. And they played an important cup game and the chairman put me at one side in the chairman's committee room and he said, Bill, why are you not playing? I said, Mr. Chairman, I've broken my elbow. He said, I'm a painkilling needle. I said, but I've broken my elbow in a couple of places. He said, I know, but you've had a needle before. I said, I've had painkillers in muscles, but never in breaks. I'm not having one. He said, well, if he had my way, he said, you'd never play for this club again. I said, well, fair enough, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to play for this club again. That's enough. And I asked for a transfer, call it a transfer. And they put me on for a world record transfer fee of £22,000. Some of you guys or ladies have watched rugby league over the years. Australia couldn't beat England in a test series. We always came out top. So what they did with their ingenuity, they decided to buy the quality English players. So one night I got a, me and Sheila, like I said, we'd, we'd nearly been divorced twice because of me. I'd left her for a few weeks and went back home. We, we got back together. Then the second time we'd separated again and we got back together. And we was even on the steps of the, the courts going looking for divorce proceedings when we got back together. Praise God, there's only God could have kept us together. And... So I, we had a chat about things, and I said, well, if an Australian club comes, she said, well, we need to do some up. We need to give it a fresh start in our lives. So I had a visit from a club called Cronulla Sharks, who, by the way, are in the grand final this week. And they said, look, Bill, we want you to come to Cronulla, Australia. I said, well, it's a long way. I said, and I know, what about the contract if we come like? <laughs> Pardon me, he said, look, we can only give you £2,000, which is a capping system like they have here today. 
we'll get your house and we'll get your job. So we had a chat, Sheila, and uh, we said we need a fresh start. I mean, I wanted a fresh start, obviously, in our marriage, but I also want to get away from her mum because I couldn't stand her mum. Me and her mum never got on. Me and my mum, me and her mum were just enemies at that particular time. So we said, we'd have a chat, we had a chat, and we said, we'll go to Australia, we'll emigrate with the three kids. Cass was about three, I think. Was he three then? So anyway, three days later, there was another club came looking at me, and that was Penrith Panthers. And they said, look, would you like to come to Penrith? I said, but I'm going to Cronulla. So they said, well, what Cronulla, what are they giving you? I said, well, I've got the two grand, the house and the job. He said, look, we'll give you the two grand. We can't give you no more till next year. But we know it's been lifted. We'll bump it up. Listen to this, 1973 to $27,000 a year. We'll get you the house, get you the job. We'll make sure you have a swimming pool and a car every year. I looked at Sheila, I said, I can't drive and I can't swim, but I know where I'm going. <laughs> so 1973, we had all our injections. We got the, the forms for emigrating to Australia. And it was our winter, December 1973. Two feet, snow, freezing, minus degrees. We've got the kids and me. Sheila, all the winter clothes, haven't we? We're very clever at school, me. I didn't know it was middle of the summer. 110 degrees. I've gone in this world record for this world record, and I've got all the TV, radio, everybody waiting for me in Australia. I was sweating like an idiot when I got off that plane. I bet they thought, who the heck's this guy Penrith have bought here? I'm walking through customs, right? And the first words from an Aussie inside his own country, he looked at my passport and he went, have we got a criminal record, sir? Wigging around to and I went, why is it still compulsory? Think about that one. So I'm in Australia. I love the place. I absolutely love the place. But the Aussies are funny people. I found them very funny people. Hilarious to a point, in fact. But as I said, the Bible says, not me, God says the devil is the god of this world, right or wrong. And he grabbed me by the scruff of the neck, twice as bad in Australia. Women came ten a penny, because over here, I played for Wigan. In Australia, believe it or not, I was a superstar. I don't say it, they do it. I don't put myself on pedestals, people do it. And I was in that situation where I was a superstar because that is the second most popular game in Australia is rugby league. Cricket and then rugby league. And so you can imagine the women, the booze and everything, what came with it. But I told you I wanted to get away from Sheila's mum. But I want a brand new car, Alfa Romeo car. But I had money from a contract, so Sheila said, we'll take the money. So I said, all right, but what are you going to do with the money? She said, I'm going to get my mum here. So she got a mum here for four years and never come back a mum. So I'll be honest, the first three months were fantastic. We did everything together. Me, Sheila and the kids, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as her mum came, in my silly mind, the world in mind, it was competition again for my wife's emotions and I just went off the rails again. But during that time, I got my mum over for a holiday. She did six months, my mum, and she used to come watching the rugby. There was one particular day we were playing a team from North Sydney at Panther Park, and uh, there was a brawl, one heck of a brawl, as you, there was in them days. I mean, praise God, rugby league's so safe today that it's great for the guys. There's hardly any injuries if there is the accidents and not nasty injuries, what people do on purpose. And the brawl subsided, and the referee just looked at me and he said, Bill, I just go for a bath. And I've looked, I won't tell you what I said to him. There's 18,000 speckies watching the game. It's on TV. I walk off. My mum walks on past me. She went straight to the middle with the referee, and she hit the referee with the handbag, my mum. 
So they got my mum, it's on TV, and they're carrying her off, and she's got a skirt up here, she's got them long bloomers down, I've never been as embarrassed in my life. But the most embarrassing thing was my next game after my suspension. We're playing a fantastic team called Eastern Suburbs, the North, they're called Sydney Roosters, and we're playing on the Sydney Cricket Ground. And it's the first scrum, and I've got hold of their great prop forward, Beatson, He's got hold of me, and we're just going to give each other a dab. And a voice from the back of the scrum, Ronnie Coot, shouted, Don't Artie, he'll send for his mum. Oh, I'd have got, got my hands on him. I'd have, I'd have, I'll not tell you what I'd have done. But I was into that game, I was into that world. But things happen in your life that you think, wow, how lucky were we? How many times have things happened in your life and you think, wow, was I lucky? Before being a Christian, becoming a Christian then we know it's not luck. The one particular, we used to take the kids to a place in, in Sydney called Luna Park, which was like Pleasure Beach. And it was directly opposite the Opera House. And we used to take the kids regular, nice fun park. And then we'd go to Taronga Park Zoo, which was just down the road. When I played on a Sunday rugby league, I never went to work on a Monday. I was always too tired or hurt or whatever. And we used to take them into Sydney on a Monday morning. Great day out when they weren't at school. So anyway, I've trained on the Wednesday this week and on the Thursday. I've got up and I, I, literally I was from nothing. I was covered in boils. I had boils all over me in places you wouldn't think existed. I couldn't walk, couldn't sit down. I couldn't train on the Friday. I couldn't play on the Saturday. Came Monday morning, I was bad. And I said, I hated not Giving, keeping my promise to the kids, I hated it, but I couldn't walk, I couldn't, and I said to the Sheila, tell the kids I'll take them tomorrow, or next week, because I might be all right next week, we'll take them next week, so we used to catch the 25 past 9 train from Penrith, into Sydney, so the kids obviously disappointed, it was their school holiday, they went playing, and I said, listen Sheila, I'll get in the pool, I said, I'll have a couple of hours in the pool, just bathing in the pool, see what happens, I got in the pool for a couple of hours and within me getting out of that, I felt so good. The boils seemed to be going as quick as they come. And praise God, I don't lie. And I've gone in the house and I felt a bit more jovial and I said to the kids, look, tell them they don't need to wait till next week, we'll go tomorrow. I've gone and put the TV in, got a brew, I see you make me a brew. Every channel you flicked over on the TV, news bulletin. That train that we was going into Sydney and always did from the mountains, from Penrith, as it was arriving into Sydney, the whole bridge of the railway road system collapsed on the first three carriages. And my kids would have been sat next to the chauffeur train because it was a steam train then. And all week I could say was, my work we look at. Praise God. I wouldn't be stood here if it was luck. Praise God that he's had so much in our lives, hasn't he, Ka? So much he's done in our lives, and we never knew it. And I never understood it until 28 years ago when Jesus came into my life. So I'm in Australia, and eventually I've, uh, I'd seen other women, and I was living that life again, and Sheila had had enough. She wanted to come home. So in 1977, what I did... Pardon me. I advanced two years' money from Penrith Panthers and I gave it to Sheila and the kids to come back and set herself up over here. She came back with her mum, praise God, and uh, she set herself up here. And I started missing Sheila and I started missing the kids. I wasn't coming home, I was shacking up over there, I was staying there, me, I was living there. I loved the life over there. And I wasn't coming back. <laughs> But I eventually started missing her. And if you remember, at that time, 1977-ish, there was a big polio scare in England. The kids were queuing up for sugar and injections and all that. And I was worried for my kids, and I asked Penrith if I could get some compassionate leave. And they said, nope. And I thought, well, you're not going to stop me. My kids are more important than you. So I just left the car, left the house, booked the flight, and I came home with no intention of going back once I was with my kids and my, my wife. When we got back together in 1977, eventually I went playing back for Wigan, and I did six months at Wigan. 
and then I fell out with the coach at Wigan and uh, I went on the transfer again for an Inter Great Britain club record and I signed for Wakefield Trinity. Well, it was at Wakefield Trinity that I started getting all my injuries. I started having, every year, I think for five years, I had operations on my knees and uh, I just I had four or five painkillers in each knee before I could play rugby and eventually it, it, it was enough, it was too much. But I was still living that daft life, I was still living a life with, uh, as I've said before, I can never reiterate enough, I was a fool. I was an absolute idiot and I didn't realise what I had. I praise God I now know what I have and I've, you know, God brought me to my senses 28 years ago. And I've had a wonderful family since then. I never had a family life. I had my own life. I did what I wanted to do. Drink, driving, everything didn't bother me. Praise God, I never got into drugs. Never, ever took a drug in my life, apart from headache tablets or whatever, or stuff what I had for my prostate. Praise God, God's cleared me a prostate cancer. So, God's wonderful. But during this time, the loneliness, Sheila started to look for companionship elsewhere. It was during our time at Wakefield that Jeeva, Je Sheila became a Jehovah's Witness when she got involved with the JWs. But I'm going to say this, if I stand up here and you think that I am calling or insulting people, I am not. But if I don't stand up here and acknowledge that being born again is the only way I am the way, the truth and the life, if I do not condemn a false teaching, then I am not sorry, saved. My Lord says, love the JW, hate the teaching. He says, love the Muslim, hate the teaching. Because if it's not from the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, it's not from God. It's as simple as that. And I will stand up here, and she'll have gone involved with the JWs. Well, we eventually came back to Wigan, and we had our, we'd had our, our, our five, we've had five children. Our Leanne was born in Wakefield. And we came back to Wigan, and Sheila became pregnant with our sixth child, our Laura. And she couldn't put watchtowers on the doors, could she? Well, that was our Andrew, wasn't it? So she became pregnant with our Laura. And she went shopping in Whistler Mains, where we live, and a car just missed knocking her down. And it frightened her that much, it started her to lose the baby. She started to hemorrhage, bleed a lot, so I carried her from where she was went straight to the hospital, took her into the maternity hospital, they gave her a scan and said for three reasons, Sheila, you wouldn't keep the baby. One, you're losing too much blood. Two, you're supposed to be 18 weeks pregnant. You've only, your fetus is only eight weeks. And three, we can't find a heartbeat. But I, I remember, you just heard of I prayed, no sex, no women, no drink. But I remember Sheila's prayer that night. We sat there and we cried together. And her prayer that night was, Lord Jehovah, if you bring this up, babe, if you save this baby, I'll bring it up to know you and your son Jesus. And as I said, we were heartbroken. Within 24 hours, she'd stopped bleeding. They took her for a scan. The fetus had doubled to 16 weeks with a strong, strong heartbeat. And that's my, one of my wonderful kids who was born again and she's sunshining in Tenerife now. Pray for her, by the way. We've just found out she's got flu. So we've got to pray for our Lord in Tenerife. But that was what Sheila started searching from. She eventually became pregnant. I didn't search anything, me. I was happy with my life. I was always happy with my life, what I was doing. And on one occasion, I left my wife for another woman. And I was living with somebody else for a while. And... Uh, but it was through you, believe it or not, we know that the Lord can use anything at any time. I was living this other woman and I came home to see my children on the weekend. And I'm waiting for the kids to get ready and Sheila's got a watchtower on a table. And then the headlines of that watchtower, the headlines were, is God in your marriage? And I read the first page and I didn't think nothing. I looked through it back on the table and went back, took her belly with me and went, to bed, this other place, this other way, lady's place, and I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning and tossing and turning, and I, I knew I had to be with my family. I knew I was in the wrong place. 
And I went back to my wife's house five o'clock in the morning and banging on the door. I said, I, I have to be here. I said, will you take me back? And she said, I will, but you sleep on bedroom floor for six weeks. So I said, praise God, I'm not bothered. I want to come back to you and the kids. you remember? And I came back. Sheila took me back. But it was during the pregnancy of our seventh child, our Andrew, that Sheila really did get into, into searching. She couldn't put watchtowers on the doors because of her carrying her Andrew. She was suffering in a bad way. And she got a visit from one of the elders. And he said, why have you not done your job this week? You're only, the only one in my group what's not got whatever, fill your card in or whatever. And I, I, I asked him to leave and he left pretty quick. But he brought somebody elder than elder than him. And he said exactly the same. So I more or less, I didn't physically, but it, they went verbally left. And I just said to Sheila, I didn't know what, like I said, it was common sense for me that if you're following a God, why are you answering to men? Are you not an answerable to your God, not a man? And it was that night, Sheila told me she got down on her knees and prayed. On the following day, Sheila had to have her morning injections for the baby. And we had a wonderful, wonderful midwife came to see us, a lady called Mary Sacker from a church at Wigan. African lady, beautiful woman. And Sheila told her troubles, told her a prayer, and within two minutes, Jesus was in my house with that Bible. And as Jesus came in, Bill was gone. I didn't want to know. Did not want to know anything. Not a thing. We're interested in God. But Sheila started, we, get, we started getting different visits with other people. And Kathy on the bike, and Maureen on the bike. And started telling these stories. And I eventually listened a little bit. And Sheila had started going to the Pentecostal church in Wigan. And she invited me a couple of times. And I'd gone and... I thought they were absolute loonies. I thought they were absolute idiots. I thought I was I was being sectioned half the time watching them. I used to sit there and they'd get up and they'd yabba dabba dooba dabba dooba dooba. I thought, what the heck's going on here? And when the pastor got up and he'd say, right, we'd take the word and we'll take the collection. I thought, nope, I don't want to know about your God and you're not giving my beer money. That's for this afternoon. So I'd go outside and I'd have a smoke. 28 years ago in November, same thing, I've gone outside, I said, I'll see you outside afterwards, Sheila. Got outside, it's absolutely chucking it down, cats and dogs. Looked in my pocket, had no cigs, had no matches, I left them at home. I thought, I'm not getting wet through, I'll sit at the back. I sat at the back of that church that morning. And it's the first time in my life that I had heard most wonderful love story that anybody could tell you. When Pastor Belfield started talking about this man called Jesus, and I couldn't believe he was talking to anybody else but me. I knew he built the practice at the back. God was talking to me. And I could relate to my children. And when he started telling me that this guy was mocked and ridiculed and laughed at, I couldn't give one of my kids up for anything like that. And then he told me that this man had every bit of his skin tore off his back. He was mutilated. He was, had three-inch thorns in the top of his head. And I couldn't, couldn't. And then he said he was dragged through the streets carrying a cross and took up this place, laid on the floor, nailed to this cross for me. Could I let one of my kids? No. And then the biggest hit point was with me. God had one only son who willingly gave his life up for me. What a love story. What an absolute love story. You know, we can search for... As I said, it comes to the time where we, we, we make a choice. I was given a choice that morning. The pastor on that platform said to me, and God said to me, and the Holy Spirit said to me, do you want to be where I am, or do you want to go to the most evil place in the world? Do you want to go to hellfire? Because it's a real place. God doesn't make things purple, blue, lilac, or pink. In God's word, it's black or it's white. It's heaven or it's hell. It's as simple as God spoke to me that morning. And I can look, I've been in, I, look, I've had so much material things in my life. I had everything when I was playing rugby league. I had money, I had cars, I had everything. 
Well, I had nothing. No, I've, I've got nothing. But praise God, I've got everything. Ask you a little question. If somebody said to you, somebody said to you this, this evening, walked in that door and said to you, there's a million dollars here. Will you have it? Would you receive it? You would, wouldn't you? But you know what? How long will it last? What will it do for you? Absolutely nothing. Girls, you go shopping. What's the favourite thing you like buying? Cloak, whatever. Shoes. Somebody said to you, buy this one shoes, pair of shoes, get 100 free. Whoa, your eyes would go tick tack to all that money, wouldn't they? But would they wear out? They would wear out, wouldn't they? I played at Wembley, I played for Great Britain, caps and medals. They don't mean a thing. They become a memory. Money becomes memory. Shoes become memory. Never remember my, my saviour. I'm in the Hall of Fame at Penrith. I'm in the Hall of Fame at Wigan. I can't get in at Wakefield. I can't get in at Wigan. But you know what? I'm in the Lamb's Book of Life. How more important by the Lord loving me so much as he did. And that choice is, do you want to accept that? I mean, the Bible talks about a second birth. John 3.16 talks about being born again, a second birth. But at the end of the day, it starts with a belief. In many places in Scripture, it says, Do you believe he who calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved? Do you believe in the name of Jesus? I'm not a preacher who said, Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this other. I'm here to say to you, Jesus said, I am who I am. I suffered as I did. I died as I did. And I rose again. A first and foremost example of our lives, how the promise of God is for us. It's simple. Well, it's two choices. It's a yes or it's a no. Do you believe that's true or do you not believe? Hands up anybody here who, is not, who has not got that one-to-one -one with Jesus. I believe we're mostly saved here. It doesn't matter if you've been to church all your life. A Sunday Christian doesn't get into heaven. We become Christians when we give our life to Christ. It's as simple as that. I want to thank you for being here. I just want to say a prayer and offer that choice. Ultimately, at the end, while we bow our heads and we close our eyes, please. If you want to say this prayer after me, just we can all say it. Just say it to yourselves in your heart. God sees hearts. God sees hearts. We don't see each other's hearts. God knows every one of us here. And as we're in this silence, God knows our every needs. Whether it be illness, whether it be money, or whether it be we need salvation. Do you know, as we've got the quietness, I lost it in the Lord. I got involved with debt. Anybody here who's been involved or still involved with debt? I got involved with debt. When I was a thought of committing suicide, I took my eyes off the Lord. I left a note for my family. I drove the car to the top of a hill, top of a cliff, and I was going over. I turned my phone off. Because I'm going to put my phone, foot on the accelerator, my phone rang, and it was my daughter. I said, what are you doing? And God spoke to my heart. He said, I am your refuge and your strength. Do not lean on your understanding. Trust in me. And I turned around and went home. And within two weeks, God had wiped my debt of 15,000 away. Because money means nothing. And in the quietness of our hearts, just say this little prayer to me, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that you died for me. I trust and believe what you did was for me, Lord. I ask you to forgive me my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Come into my heart, Lord. And Father God, let me put you first and foremost above everything. I love you, Lord. Redeem me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you've said that for the first time and you mean it and you've never said it or made an active statement to God before, 
Just put your hand up. Don't be embarrassed. I'm not just talking to people here. I'm talking to you on that camera as well. It's the greatest promise that anybody can offer. And it's the greatest gift that anybody can receive. And I thank God that I received that 28 years ago. And I'm not a perfect Christian. If anybody walks up and says, I'm the perfect Christian, say, kiss my legs. There's one Jesus Christ, my Savior. We make mistakes because we're sinners. But we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And we are covered by the mistakes we made. And I thank God for my salvation. I thank God for my daughter and my family's salvation. All my family are born again. Again, we can stand firm. You and your household will be saved. Amen. And that's what it's all about, believing. And I thank you for tonight. And I pray that God's touched any of your situations, what you need touching with. I can't. He can't. We can pray, but the ultimate is God. So thank you and bless you all. And it's been a real pleasure. Amen. Thank you.